underground coal mining. A whale life in these mountains of Appalachia for well over 150 years. And I'm the third generation in my family of coal mine. And I put a stop to it. Not that it's bad, it's just a hard way of life. And I want better for my children. And I know everybody else does too. Now everybody can relate to this story that I'm going to tell about my experience of growing up in these old coal mines, more or less, from back in the 70s when I started. Now, I had it nothing bad like my grandfather or my father had it back in these mines. They had hard times. And no, when I started in the mines, the mining camps were still around. But I didn't live in no mining camp while I was working. And you didn't get paid by scrip anymore, too. Them days was long gone. The mining camps are still around, but they're on their way out when I started in the mine. And not many people lived in them anymore. They was able to make a good living that they could buy a home off like everybody else. Now, a lot of people work these mines can relate a lot of good family members never came home or if they did come home later in life black lung took them out I know I have a touch of it myself after 20 something years in these old mines now I started out my life in these coal mines back when I was just out of high school I married early started a family early, and they wasn't with nothing to do in these mines in these countries around this area. You either worked in the coal mines or you moved on down the line. And I had a family and this is my home, and I wasn't leaving these mountains, because when I was a small child, I had to live in these cities for a little while. That was the way it was, and I swore that I'd never go back to it. So I started out here the only place you could make any decent money in the coal mine. And it was that, like the old song says, rich man goes to college and a poor man goes to work. And back in them days, they said, oh, Donnie, you could got an education. Well, there was no internet back in them days. There was no evening classes. There wasn't even no satellite community schools around in them days. You either went to work or you went to college. And to go to college, you had to move off and have money. Well, I didn't have neither. I was not going to do neither. So I went in the coal mine. So here's my experience of how it was in the 70s, of how it used to be, how it was, and how it still is in these old coal mines. Now, I started off my career in the mines in a place called Tackett Creek, just across the state line in Tennessee, Claiborne County. And here's a picture of the old mines. This is what it looked like. And I was lucky and fortunate. My first mines was the United Mine Workers of America mine. I owe a lot to them for my health and my safety as I got older and made a good living working here. So I owe a lot. A lot of people have to give at least give credit to the union for making wages so much better. And you just didn't start in the mines walking in. You had to do 40 hours training back then. This was back in the early 70s. You had to have 40 hours minor training. You had to know what you was doing, at least know something about what you was doing. So they done a lot of training. We done roof control, first aid, mining procedures, mining laws, and uh, roof control, and all these things. You had to learn this stuff. That was just part of it. And when you started out, you was a red cap. You had to be a red cap for one year. And that means that you couldn't be by yourself for one year. You had to wear a red cap to be recognized. And they issued everybody 
a self-rescuer, which is a W-65. It didn't contain no oxygen, but it had a filter system in it that could filter out smoke, carbon monoxide. So this was really a big safety if you ever got in a fire and you had smoke. So we had to be trained for that and keep it on its own person at all times. Now the next thing nowadays, they don't have these no more. Nowadays, they come up with a new kind of thing called the SCSR. And this SCSR means self-contained self-rescue. Now these do contain oxygen. They come out in the late 80s, we started using them. And they still use them today, just a modern version. So these would save your life up to one hour of oxygen supply, give or take, just how much you use it or exhaust it. But it is a self-contained, self-rescuer. And he issued us wheat lights. These are the old battery lights that was by distilled water. And here's the charger for them. You could take it home in some places. I have used these with the charger at home your responsibility. But the big mines usually had charging racks. Everybody would have their own name and their own charger rack. That's sure a long, far cry from the old carbide lights of the time. Now nowadays, they have the new lights. They're cordless, they're LEDs. These things can last 13 to 16 hours compared to the old wheat lights. They don't only last about eight or 10 hours. And everybody had their own tag board on the tag board where you tag yourself in and tag yourself out. That way they could know who was in the mines and who wasn't in the mines. They even issued a belt to you. Now here we learn the mining procedures. And here in the mining is conventional mining with a continuous miner and a shuttle car. And this is how it is. They work five different entries according on your, your mining plan. And here was the machine of the day, a continuous miner, preferably a joy back in them days. And he could mine more coal in one minute than a man could load all day long. And I never did do any long wall mining in my career. Now here's the different types of mines the entries into the mine. You got the shaft mines, the drift mines, and the uh, just a strip mine, but what I started out with was a slope mine. Now here is a general mine map of the whole mine. It can get very complicated. Just This is just an example. And this here is like two different sections. This is how the ventilation plan is and how you're mining and you keep the maps up. Now the mines I started at, they had nine sections. And these all these mines, each mine was three of them connected. And they was all ventilated by fans like this. Now the seam we worked was the high. Now I've never worked a seam this high, but as time went on, as my mining career, it seemed like the older I got, the lower the seam got, all the way down to 26 inches. And I didn't care much about that. So we, you did, you got your 40 hour training. There's just so much to cram. So it's time to go to work. Training's over. Now I reported to work, started out, I had to work the owl shift. If you don't know what that is, it was 12 at midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning. And if you're used to the day shift, sleeping all night, working all day, oh, it's a world of difference. It is so hard to get used to. I don't know how bad that feeling was. The worst feeling I ever had in my life was on a Sunday night when you've been up all day with the family. And at about 10.30 at night, you pack your lunch and you head towards the mine. Now, I was lucky enough to have a place, this mine had a bathhouse, where you could go change into your work clothes, tag yourself in, get your light, get ready, 
get with your me and your buddies, and you get in the man trip, and you head in the mine. Now this is a picture of the modern man trips on track. People get in and they go to the working sections and go on off to the face. But back when I started, they didn't have track in this part of the mines that I was in. So we would get in an old man trip that was pulled by an old battery motor or a scoop sometimes if the motor was down. And it would take us exactly, I've timed it, one hour to get to the face. One hour. So you'd sleep like a baby in that thing, it being the midnight shift. Oh man, and when you got there, oh, that was the worst feeling in the world having to get up. And me being a young boy, everything was new to me, but it was still hard trying to work all night. It took some time to get used to it, but my body finally adjusted. You never did get used to it. You just got, feel, got used to feeling like crap all the time. That was just the way it was. And when I first started in the mine, my job assigned to me was a shuttle car driver. And there's two kinds of shuttle cars. There's a standard and an off standard, if you know what I'm talking about. And I had the off standard. And what I mean by off standard, everything steers backwards on it. A standard steers like a normal vehicle. But an off standard is backwards. And man, was I hard at it at first. I would hit the rib get, just trying to get used to steering backwards. But as time went on, I got good at it. It just comes second nature. The more you tried, the more you practiced, the more you got it. And sometimes I would pull between that miner and that shuttle car with that miner to the feeder a hundred, hundred so trips a night, really pouring it on it. And I done that year after year. I, after the first year, I was no longer a red cap. I was still driving a shuttle car. And as time went on, I got into maintenance. And I stayed in maintenance most of my mining career. But anyway, from time to time, I would get out of maintenance, but I'd always be at the face. I'd run a miner a lot, too. And we, on these minor sections, with a conventional miner, we would always have to do some pillar. When you drove a section up as far as its limits, you would pull back, pulling the pillars. That's called robbing. And here's another little old plan that I draw to show how it is robbing. And the ideal is you pull the pillars out as you come back, and you do a lot of timbering for safety. And you get in there and you cut one way while the boat machine's cutting another a boat in a place and then you'll change places back and forth till you cut through that pillar and then you start winging it out setting timbers every time and then when you get to that last little peg there called the push out that's where she gets hurt but you can pull three or four pillars or a row of pillars and not have no problems at first because you left a barrier pillar around but as your time goes on the more pillars you pull the heavier that top got. And as the heavier that top got, it started taking weight. And the idea was, is to get it to fall in front of you, not behind you. But sometimes they didn't take enough coal, or the top was had a bad seam in it or something, it would start riding back behind you. That's when it got dangerous. It would fall out, just for no reason, just fall out in the intersections and stuff. So you'd have to do a lot of cribbing here and there on your returns. So this was a dangerous job, especially trying to work at night. It was a hard life, I'm telling you. But it was nothing compared to what my father and grandfather had to go through hand loading all these hard days. But anyway, you learn a lot of different stuff. You worked a lot of overtime. You would do a lot of rock dusting. And that consisted of just spraying rock dust on the coal to keep the dust down, keep the coal dust down, the combustible materials. And you done a lot of supply work too in your overtime. And you learned as a young man from the old men, the old timers had been there. They teach you so much. And what they would tell you is stuff like 
you're coupling up these cars. Now, nowadays they got scoops and equipment that just, it's got these systems in them where they just ease up and ease back and forth just real slow. But back then they didn't have that kind of equipment. It was called like points. You got first point, second point, wide open. Well, sometimes the points on them was, would jump. They would jump just like jump from one. You, when you're trying to couple up a, a supply car, like a picture right here, then things wouldn't ease up where you could stick a pin in them. They would jump. And if you didn't hold that pin just right, I've seen so many old timers with fingers missing. And this is what mostly caused it. They would be coupling up something and that old thing would jump and that pin was not lined up with them holes and he'd cock it at an angle. And these old pins are mostly made out of just a steel rod with a roof bolt plate welded in it to keep it from falling on through. And that thing was not perfectly unlined up and that thing would jump like a little, like a scalded dog just jump and your hands in the wrong position, he'd cock that pin over and cut your finger slick dab off. So you learn real quick, when you coupling something up, you would lay it up there close and you'd put your hand on top of it. So if it went wild, you could get away from it. If you've got a hold of it around the side of it, it would cut your fingers or maybe even cut your hand off. So this is an old trick the old timers, they I've seen too many of them with bad missing fingers. This is bad. That's another old experience. So, and then you, we do a lot of this robbing stuff. I'll show you here what a miner looks like loading the shuttle car. This is a car setting up. I could pull that miner up and I could sump it up in that coal. It'd take it a little bit to sump up into it. And then when you backed up and dropped that head, I could cover that shuttle car up in just a matter of seconds. I could put 10 ton on it in just seconds. But anyway, when, we're, when you're robbing here, it, it, it gets real tricky when you hear these timbers beside you break. Now that's real tricky. Well, that old shuttle car, he'd go down there to the feeder and he'd dump. Here's showing him how he's dumping on that feeder. And they come back, and when you're robbing that shuttle car, I told them to tap me. I know they're against me because when all that, that ripper head are running and all that noise of cutting that coal, you can't hear nothing. You can't hear nothing, and you can't see nothing either for the dust. So you'd, hear, you'd feel that car bump the back of you. Now back then, we run our miners in the deck. You got in the deck and run it. But we had canopies over ours. Most all equipment over a certain height in coal had a canopy on. But with a certain height lower, you didn't have to have a canopy. But we had canopy. And I'd feel that shuttle car hit me, and I'd load it. And I'd be trying to listen to a timber breaking. And when you got in that push out, man, it got real dangerous. So we just... I go to backing up, I tell that car driver, when I go to backing up, you better get out from under me because I'm backing up. And I'd back up and we'd sit and listen and watch it fall and see what it's going to do. And if we thought it wasn't too bad, we'd go back there and get a little bit more. But a lot of times we'd just leave it, timber it off, go to another place. That was just the way safety was. It was, it was a dangerous work, but you got used to it. But I've had a lot of friends that wasn't so lucky. Now these old miners, they're dangerous, but the dust is really bad on them. I tried to keep the water sprays. If you keep your water sprays working real good and you got your curtain up and good ventilation, it, it's not too bad. But still, I would always wear a dust mask whenever possible. I would keep extra filters in my lunch bucket. My wife would change them every time she made lunch for me every night. She would put new filters in to keep it clean. I really appreciated that. That really saved me down the road in my life. That really helped. And these new miners, they just coming out with the remote controls when I was getting out of the mining industry. 
Now, I never did like these things. From what I've seen and heard, more people's been hurt by these than anything. You didn't get this kind of predicament sitting in the deck. It was kind of rough sometimes and noisy, but it was a lot safer. These things, they'll mash you accidentally hit the wrong button and it's instant death. Now on a section, usually you had eight men on a working section. Nine if you was lucky. You had a minor man, a minor helper, two shuttle car drivers, two rope boulder men, a section mechanic, and a foreman. And if you're lucky, you had a utility man run the scoop that made nine. That was average manpower on one section. So if you got a mines with nine sections and then belt men and supply men, that adds up real quick. And the most dangerous job I think in the mines is a roof boat. That is a real hazardous job because you're working under unsupported top most of the time trying to support the top for everybody else. It is a dangerous job. They used to use timbers, went to shuck boats, and now they're nothing but glue boats. And that's a major concern right there. And that utility man, he would go around and supply the roof boater man with roof boats and get bradish block up to build a bradish or just clean the ribs and muck the feeder. That was a necessity too. Here it is mucking the feeder. You get, you get so much cold spillage hauling that coal that the coal, I've seen the car's high center on that coal. So he'd keep it clean or you keep the roadway still going. Now here's what everything on the section was powered with. We call them power centers. That's where everything plugs in. Every company had different voltages. But here, this is 600 volts down to 480. But this powered all the machinery on the section, all the mobile equipment. And here's what I done a lot of in maintenance when I was in it, electrical work. I really loved doing this throughout the whole mine. And I evolved that I left this mine even more. Now these men always seemed like they eat dinner, had a good time to get together eat dinner. Sometimes you're boating while somebody's eating or vice versa. But they always always got together and ate. And it was kind of nasty in places. So I took it up on myself. When I wasn't too busy, I would keep us a dinner hole up. I would clean us a good place out with a scoop. I would rock dust it real good. Even made us some benches. Got some old oil cans and put garbage bags in them and kept them clean and changed out. The men really appreciate it. Here you can catch one of us here at night taking a little nap during lunch break. That happened all the time. And here's an old section foreman of mine sitting in the dinner hole. Kept it bradish off. There's the mine phone where we talk to the outside in all our communications. Back in the old days. Now we've been in all kinds of mine disasters, flooding, fires, smoke, rock falls, you name it. But one thing that we all dreaded and never had to deal with is some people did. A lot of people died in these mine explosions. You don't stand much of a chance in them. It knocks out all the brashes and all the ventilation and the smoke don't get you, you suffocate. That's the worst catastrophe in a mine, worse than a rock fall. And but still the coal kept flowing, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, keeping that coal going. And I'm usually normally two to three days a unit train would come in and haul it out of here. So they'd average at least four, maybe six unit trains in 10 days, easily. A lot of coal come out of these mountains. All mountains, all these Appalachians. The equipment's changed, it's updated. Better equipment, better equipment like shuttle cars. Miners is even updated. They got scrubber systems now. 
to suck the dust up. There's so much improvements. And even the low vein vehicles and low coal, 30 inch coal, where you can get around. Not crawling so much. Not riding in a scoop bucket. But still, the principle of mining is the same. The equipment's updated and better techniques, but it's still got the dangers. These old mines, they just keep going. I spent 23 years underground in these coal mines, but in 96, I left the coal industry because I got tired of changing jobs. And these old working hands, like so many men in these mines, have given their lives to these mines. Only have their people turn their back on them. But they're still out there. My time back in the 70s on is come and gone. And so it's a lot of other these good men. But they still out there today, still working day in and nights and days, still trying to supply coal and make a living for their families. So I want to dedicate this to all the miners out there that's still struggling to make a living in these old coal mines. So I hope you enjoyed this little thing of the what it was when I was in the mines and it still is today. So I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.